Welcome. My name is Creighton Jones. Joining me today are Ouyang Tang, Sky Shields, and Peter Martinson. And we are of Lyndon LaRouche's scientific research team, otherwise known as The Basement. In our last discussion, we took up the ontology and implications of the most recent of the great extinctions, the one which occurred 62 million years ago, known as the KT extinction. The extinction which wiped the most powerful creature which had then yet walked the planet, the dinosaurs, off of its surface. That then cleared the way for the emergence and radiation of the mammals. What became clear in that discussion was that life as a whole has a definite directionality to it. In other words, life is always moving towards higher states of organization and complexity and reflects the overall creative nature of the universe as a whole. What also became clear in that discussion was that the relationship between any specific species and the biosphere and the universe as a whole can be summed up in a fairly simple rule, which states, if you don't progress, if you don't evolve, the universe will leave you behind to die. Now this is a principle which humanity as a whole must come to embrace, as has become clear through the policies of Obama and the devolutionary policies of the Greenies. If we as mankind continue to try to hold on to an idea of a fixed state of existence, the achieving of a kind of equilibrium, then we ourselves will face a great extinction. A step towards the evolution of the human race has occurred in the last few days with the announcement on the part of Vladimir Putin that he will be running for the presidency of Russia. This has the full support of the current president, Medvedev, and what it represents is a move on the part of Russia towards the kind of three-power policy which Lyndon LaRouche has been striving for. This would be an alliance between the U.S., Russia, and China, and it would be oriented around great projects. The one in particular which we'll be focusing on, or have been focusing on, is what's known as the Bering Strait Project, which would use a series of bridges, underground canals, and other types of infrastructure to connect the Eurasian continent with North America and creating the conditions for integrated trade and development among those two great continents. Now this will be integrated into another policy which we've been pushing, what's known as NAWAPA, the North American Water and Power Alliance, which calls for the movement of massive amounts of water that would otherwise flow into the ocean to be diverted down into Canada, the United States, and Mexico to facilitate massive irrigation projects. Projects similar to this will be taken up on a global scale and would create the conditions for the transformation of the geology of our planet, the hydrological cycles on a planetary scale, and the creation of entirely new weather systems. Now to fully understand the implications of this kind of a project, we must go beyond the understanding as has been taught by the reductionist and materialist and move to the domain of what we've come to call cosmic radiation or the entire spectrum of the electromagnetic frequency scale. The foundation upon which we'll be developing the discussion today centers around two great figures of the late 19th and early 20th century, two great Russian figures, Vladimir Vernadsky and Alexander Gervich. Gervich is responsible for developing and introducing, probably in the most rigorous way, the idea of a morphological field, the idea that life is oriented, organized, and regulated by a field which is unique to life, which determines its development and unfolding. He looked at it from the standpoint of three successive levels of development, from the biological molecular level, to the cellular level, to then the organismal level, and saw this biological field intimately connected with another great discovery of his, the discovery of mitogenic radiation. That is, that life emits a kind of UV radiation, which it uses as a means of regulation and communication among the cells of a living organism. Vladimir Vernadsky took it from the opposite direction. He looked at the entirety of the biosphere, the entire envelope of life, as one continuous single process, which is evolving and developing with a direction to it, and which is intimately connected with cosmic radiation of the sun and broader cosmological forces. So what we intend to do is to look at 
the unification of these two directions of the development of life in terms of cosmic radiation, electromagnetic fields, and to start to move beyond the idea of life as discrete objects situated within an otherwise empty space, but instead take this up as a nonlinear continuum, a filled plenum of electromagnetic fields and radiations which constitute the kind of space-time which we necessarily must intervene into if we're going to continue to push mankind and the universe forward. Now what I'd like to do is turn to Sky Shields to maybe give us some more on the history of the relationship between this idea of the investigation of morphological development and evolution of life as a whole. I mean, there's, it's, it's nice to go back to look at that period that you're describing, this late 19th century, early 20th century developments, especially as things kind of reach a peak around the 20s and 30s. A lot of bad stuff happened, a lot of good stuff. Uh, because when you look back at that, you see the real questions about living processes were being taken up rather explicitly. And this idea of the directedness was very clear. Uh, mainly, you know, primarily what, what's, what's of interest to us here is that there was recognized that, yeah, what you're saying there was a clear relationship, continuity between the different types of directedness. As Vernotsky called it, the different types, levels of biological time. Mm -hmm. That you know, the big mystery at the time, you know, still a mystery now, even though it's, there's hand wavy approaches to explaining it, is uh, what's called morphogenesis which is how starting from the single cell, the single egg cell, do you get the development of a complex, large adult organism capable of making more. Mm -hmm. uh, to, that's the investigation Gerbich was looking at when he was developing his concept of the morphogenic field. This was so clearly gestalt and just holistic in its approach that it really did freak out the reductionists who were pushing for political control in the US and globally at that time. And so you had the whole you know, program, the real fraud of Watson and Crick run against that. Mm -hmm. And you had it kind of hammered down that somehow you can explain all of this development of the organism on the basis of something encoded in the DNA. Now, right. now looking at it, we're starting to realize that there's, it's becoming more and more clear what should have been clear at the outset, that there's a thousand holes in that. Right. You know, won't even go all the stuff, people attempting to try and plug the holes, looking at epigenetics and other things. But it's becoming clear there's obviously something much more happening there than something encoded in the DNA, and that the character of it is what Vernadsky described, that you've got a clear directedness of a process that is anti-entropic, that, 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 that at the very beginning, the inception of that organism, it has a desire to become an adult organism, right. not in some simple back-to-forward way, but in a, a process of development that you can interrupt along the way, and it'll still figure out its, its path. It's an intention. Right. Not simple determinism. So even in the DNA, there's nothing in the DNA of any one cell which tells it how it knows to become a finger cell versus a hair cell versus a liver right. cell or something like that. And then what gets expressed, I mean, it, it's been described, which I like, as sort of trying to study the, trying to explain an organism on the basis of DNA is like trying to explain the way a radio works by listening to a cassette tape. Right. That is that there's nothing, the cassette tape is part of the whole technology, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But the technology is the technology. Right. You've got something there that's not, that's not described by that one little element of it. Uh, but then where Vernadsky takes it, he says, well, look, you've got to look. What you've got here is you've got something, it's a clear expression of what he referred to as a Romanian space time. Mm -hmm. That he said, well, the, the kind of the same boundedness you have of an organism in space, which he, he saw as being an indicator of a... Of a uh, of a you know of a Ramanian geometry in space that among other things he is a, is accompanied by this boundedness in time, mm -hmm. which you begin to get with living processes as opposed to non living processes that they have a beginning and an end, and as a result you see these periodicities that mm -hmm. he describes as sort of the the steady development of generation after generation after generation organism after organism, which gives you one directed anti entropic cycle in time. But then as you look at the broader level, you start to look at evolutionary processes, you see they're exactly it's the same thing, right. but just a larger cycle superimposed on the smaller cycle that you get of the succession of generations and organisms. Right. Um. So you get this real structure to time that he keeps pointing out is exactly parallel to the one you get in space, that it is a biological space-time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that obviously poses all sorts of interesting questions. I mean, you take a look at the big push right now from you know freaks like Dawkins, et cetera, to try and describe 
evolutionary processes in the large as the as the result of all kinds of chaotic processes in the small. Right. They can only do that by trying to separate those two, separating morphogenesis and evolution. Because you look at morphogenesis and you, it's evident that you've got a directedness there. Nobody right. would argue that it was just sort of random statistics right. in the small. <laughs> you know, you might have grown up to be Cody or you might have grown up to be some large squirrel right. or something Purely like chance that. that your mother gave birth to a human being as opposed to a squid or something. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. Yeah, that's absurd. On that level, it's absurd. So then you take the, the morphogenic field approach that Gervich had to the single organism, to morphogenesis, you start now applying that to the whole development of the planet. Mm -hmm. You start, you realize that, okay, there is a clear, that same quality of directiveness of what was then called regulation is occurring on that level. And then the things that are currently anomalies from the standpoint of Darwinian theory actually become your, your, your main elements to rest on. Right, you actually wanted to get at one of those anomalies, something we've discussed before as parallel evolution, mm -hmm. where it seems that you get completely separate types of organisms, even different species, evolving the same traits, even though there doesn't seem to be any kind of kinematic relationship between them. No, right. But they develop, in parallel, very similar traits and, and necessary relationships. If you look at the, yeah, the whole history of evolutionary processes is that there's sort of three things, there's three terms which you know, our audience can look at that are treated as separate that you'd want to lump together. Mm -hmm. One's parallel evolution, so-called, convergent evolution. Uh, one term I like, which is interesting, is repeated innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, but you take all those things as sort of as what seem to be separate anomalies from the Darwinian standpoint, but are very interesting from any other standpoint, which is, yeah, right, you take a look at one chart we've showed here before. If you look at the development of, say, feathers in the mm -hmm. fossil record, that you get feathers developed in roughly their, what you consider to be the modern form of feathers, completely distinctly at different point, moments in history and, com and otherwise unrelated uh, groupings of animals. Mm -hmm. You know, the argument now is in order to save the Darwinian tree idea, they posit some artificial creature at the beginning that must have had some kind of proto feathers that they can't see, and right. all these are really related to it. Right. But looking at the reality of the fossil record, you just see these things appearing as singularities all over the place. Mm -hmm. Same thing, for instance, with, with almost any major development. Mm -hmm. Like, take the development of photosynthesis. Appears all over the place, completely unrelated creatures, different moments in history. Mm -hmm. uh, only certain of those, of those tracks end up making it to the present each time. Right. You've got a few groups of it. Uh, but in the fossil record, you see all these well, class attempts to produce that technology. Mm -hmm. Development of mammals, same thing. Mammalian traits appear more than once, and several distinct groups make it into the present with those mammalian tra traits. Other ones just have vanished. Right. The development of, of, uh, of teeth, the development of just of major types of, any major breakthrough that you have in, and that you would consider to be a major step in evolutionary development leading to us, happens repeatedly in groups that are unrelated to each other, hmm. which leads you to look for a cause that's outside of the individual organisms. Right, this seems to have also a relationship to a Riemannian type of geometry, where as he develops in his, sort of his systems approach or his, uh, his use of Dirichlet's principle, where you're looking at some boundary change of the whole system, where the whole system undergoes some sort of boundary condition shift mm -hmm. or a singularity introduction, which then radiates through the entire system, mm -hmm. but which is not a function of some point-to-point -point transformation, but the whole system goes through an upshift that then expresses itself in many different places internal to that dynamic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you had also brought up in some of our recent discussions something which it becomes anomalous from the standpoint of parallel evolution because it, it does look at a certain way in which some of these traits, so to speak, can possibly be radiated throughout the system, which is this uh, this whole idea of the um, the the viral infection right. or what um, I call horizontal gene yeah, transfer. horizontal gene transfer is sort of this is you know and this is this is another one of those things like the like the epigenetics where on one level it's a very interesting field, mm -hmm. but the attempt now is to introduce it as an epicycle to correct the problems that were already existing with with uh -huh. the Dar with the Darwinian view of evolution, but the reality of it is that you can you can see. There's a number of very clear cases in the, uh, in the, uh, in, I'll, I'll take one example right now. Take the development of the human placenta. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. at least one of the proteins in the human placenta, which is capable of uh, giving the, the human placenta one of its properties, which is that of a, of a, of a syncytium. One, there's a whole layer of cell cells that are capable of losing their cell walls and becoming basically one giant cell mm -hmm. with one giant multinucleated cell. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a major part of our, of our reproductive process. If you look at the, the, the strip of nucleic acid that's supposed to correspond to that protein, mm -hmm. the enzyme that does that, it is one of the ones that we recognize as having a viral origin. Hmm. Meaning that what it looks like, is, it looks as though at some point in the past, as a species, we were infected by a virus which was capable of producing this protein. Hmm. And then we absorbed it into our actual hmm. genome. And if you look, there's a number of major elements in, there's a number of things that are as crucial in ourselves and in other species that also have a similar viral origin. Well, with the placenta, for example, that's not just simply a change, but that actually does represent an upshift. Yeah. I mean, that's something which has gone a long way towards our ability to foster and develop healthy young. So yeah. it was, it's not just a viral change, but it's a real upshift that seems to be in some way mediated you by... You think kids are messed up now? Imagine if they yeah. hatch from eggs. Right. <laughs> it really damages the uh, right. parental relations. <laughs> <laughs> have a latchkey kid, so huh? right. Hatch <laughs> Hatch kids. kids. <laughs> but anyway, no, right. exactly. And so, the, but this idea of what's called horizontal gene transfer, the ability to to get a genetic trait from somebody horizontally as opposed to vertically. Mm -hmm. If I were to like decide to like give either you or Young or Pete some trait where mm -hmm. you and then your offspring would end up having a similarity to me, you know, but then you also. Not just your offspring, not just that we made it and then produced some child, but you, mm -hmm. I'd be able to lend you some trait without us having to be otherwise related. I'd have a hard time explaining that to my family. <laughs> 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 but that's something that happens all the time, in, especially in the oceans. In the oceans, it's rampant. Mm -hmm. In the oceans, especially with single-celled creatures, it's almost, you know, they might as well, you know, you don't have a choice of who you share fluids with in the ocean. Right. It just sort of floats over to you. Right. Uh, but then you also see it on land with certain at certain major inflection points. You see creatures on land having the exact same character. Right. So that's significant. That started to give you an ability to uh, gives you an ability to start to, to see well how do you have something else besides the individual organism mm -hmm. battling for its survival that's developing its traits. It gets you this gestalt picture. Mm -hmm. But then you want to add an element which I guess people will get into, but an element of just well, you know what other properties. You have to change your idea of what a virus is from being something that's just struggling for its own survival and trying to right. infect you. Yeah, right. So that, yeah, with Pete, we can actually start to move away from what might people might interpret as a kind of kinematic process because you've been looking at the fact that viruses are very much connected to galactic phenomena. Yeah, and uh, I'd just like to go back. You mentioned uh, his name, Richard Dawkins, this total screwball nutcase wrote a whole book, his theory apparently is that uh, people and all other organisms in the biosphere are simply vehicles for genes that are trying to propagate themselves, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's a screwball idea, but uh, especially in the face of just, you know, going all the way back uh, in the history of medicine, it's pretty obvious that that's not true. But then just recently, some of the evidence coming out uh, makes it just totally obvious that this guy's ideas are for lack of a better word, retarded, uh, viruses should be the most uh, obvious case of a selfish gene, right? Because viruses, you know, what do viruses do? They infect you and they make you sneeze so that you propagate them, right? So they should be the, the perfect example of, uh, of the selfish gene. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you look at, you know, what viruses are actually most studied, there are uh, immense paradoxes in this. The, one of the most studied viruses right now is the uh, influenza, the influenza virus, right. which uh, people know. You know, people get the flu shots and stuff like that, which supposedly disrupt the uh, the ability of the flu virus to propagate. There are a lot. It's the most studied uh, virus, but the paradoxes that are coming up reveal that it, it, it has nothing to do with the selfish gene. There's something else that's mediating the uh, effects of this thing. Some of the paradoxes are one, it, obviously it's seasonal, right? right? It right. hits every winter. It comes on very quickly 
it hits, you know, there are places in the world that it begins, like mainly, you know, Eastern Asia. Mm -hmm. but when it hits, it propagates very quickly around the globe and hits um, virtually without distinction of who it's hitting. There are no conditions that, uh, that seem to propagate it. It doesn't matter if you're living inside or outside, if you're living in a warm climate, cold climate, doesn't matter. Right. Uh, when it's over, it ends very quickly and mm -hmm. it's gone. And then it's gone for, uh, you know, all the summer months in the north. Where is it that whole time? Mm -hmm. If it's a selfish gene, why not hit in the summer? All right, you know, some people will say, well, maybe uh, it likes the cold. It doesn't necessarily like the cold. It's too warm to wear jeans in the summer, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Depends on what kind of jeans you wear. But, um, but there, are other, uh, there are other paradoxes. Back when the uh, 1918 flu pandemic struck and killed you know, millions of people around the globe, mm -hmm. this one guy did an experiment to test the transmissibility of the virus. And he, it was kind of a gross experiment. He, had, he went into schools and found kids that got sick with flu and tried to get them like on the first day that they started showing symptoms and had them essentially cough in a plate. <laughs> they rinsed out the nostrils so that they could get all the goop out, cleaned everything out, um, had them cough more and then swabbed the mucous membranes and made kind of like a soup of you know body fluid mm -hmm. and then put this in a spray bottle and sprayed 100 soldiers who had never been infected by the virus in the eyes, spray them in the mouth with their, while they're inhaling. Did, I mean, they should have gotten infected. Not one of those soldiers got infected by the virus. Hmm. All right, and you know, there are various reasons that were uh, brought up, like maybe once you start to express the symptoms, you're no longer, um, infectious. You're no longer infectious. But still, it's a strange result. And this kind of thing has been repeated throughout, uh, throughout the past you know, 100 or so years. And it's very clear that it can't be transmitted like that. It's not, it's not a transmissible virus like that. Mm -hmm. Now, one guy back in the uh, you know, 50s and 60s named Hope Simpson uh, began to suspect, and he did a lot of study of uh, the problems with flu. He started to suspect that um, the propagation of flu had very little to do with specifically transmission of a virus particle. Um, and it had little to do with what the living conditions were when the flu was being spread, but it had everything to do with uh, what was happening with the sun. Hmm. So he suspected that the sun somehow triggered the release of, triggered the, uh, as, if it, as if the sun has some effect in turning on the virus globally. Hmm. Right. Um, now later, uh, there were other studies done, for example, a Canadian study which was done showing that if you take all the major pandemics of flu that we know of and you find out where they occur based on the solar cycle, you find that uh, most of them happen within a year or two of solar maximum when you have the most, uh, the most sunspots, which incidentally we're going into solar maximum now and mm -hmm. you know, possibly we're due for a major pandemic. Right. Um, or uh, take swine flu, which hit, what, a year ago? Mm-hmm. Um, Another study was done in China showing that uh, there seems to be a high incidence of pandemic flus hitting around the times of high cosmic ray flux. Hmm. So there are all these paradoxes which indicate that flu, which should be you know, the basic infectious virus, is not infectious in the way, uh, the way that you would expect. But instead, it's, be, it's a global effect mm -hmm. that's being driven by a cosmic a cosmic uh, impetus, so right. to speak. Right. Now, uh, you know, uh, disregarding for the moment the question of whether DNA is what uh, is what gives you your traits or not. Mm -hmm. Viruses are not; uh, they're not solely designed to go and kill you. It's actually the exception of the virus. Mm -hmm. Exceptional viruses actually injure you somehow. Right. But now they're doing. You know, Sky mentioned they're doing surveys of viruses in the ocean. Right. And they're finding all these viruses that seem to have nothing to do with hurting anything. Like uh, <laughs> they, found, they found a virus that pretty much all it contains is the full genetic code for the photosynthesis apparatus. Right. This thing is not going to go and infect something and then make it blow up and spill a bunch more viruses out right. to go and infect anything. It's going to give a capability for producing photosynthesis. Right. You know, whether that's how organisms got the photosynthesis capability, 
is a different question. But it is definitely advantageous to that particular sea slug. Right. Yeah, exactly. Just as the development of a placenta was very advantageous to mammals. Right. So the point is that... Yeah, but this one for the, uh, yeah. for the, the photosynthesis virus, they don't know what that one infects. That one is capable. It looks like it could infect anything. Hmm. It's very hard, but it is. Hmm. So it's, it's just they're waiting to drop off photosynthesis and something else. Hmm. We might hmm. figure out how to infect people with it. <coughs> Change our dietary habits. Hmm. You know, on the note of the ocean thing, the other place where they found a number of uh, viruses recently is they just recently did a... Nobody's yet done a viral survey of the human organism, but they just recently did one of the human gut track. And so just looking for the viruses that are in your intestine... There's a, if you look online for anything called poop study, virus poop study, it shows up. But if you do that, uh, they found, oh, I'm forgetting the figure, I'm gonna terrible with the numbers, but something like 40,000 new viruses, some ridiculous, well, four or 40,000 either way, it's in the thousands. Hmm. So it's just huge new viruses that everybody is infected by and are definitely not killing you, not even making you sneeze, they're doing something. I mean, interesting just aspect, just going back to this guy, Hope Simpson, uh, his theory, and he died in like the 90s, early 90s, he thought that what happens is that the sun does something mm -hmm. to uh, essentially activate hyper-infectious persons. That somehow the, somehow the sun activates these people to become kind of like the propagators of the, of the disease, of the virus, or of the effects of the virus. And he shows that it's over all cultures everywhere on the globe. So it does raise the question, which is raised you know, in other forms, um, are viruses generated by the organisms right. as opposed to being some random things that are floating through, you know, the atmosphere somewhere? Mm -hmm. Is it something that's being produced by the organism? Right. And if that's the case, and it's driven by some type of cosmic radiation, um, then the question is, okay, well, what is the cosmic radiation telling right. the viruses in order to do things uh, like produce something that could potentially give new capabilities to an organism. Right. Well, this gets us definitely to something which Ouyang has taken up pretty rigorously in looking at this relationship between radiation and what we might think of as the, the material substrate or the, the biomolecules, and this being the work of people like Dr. Luc Montagnier and others who looked at this relationship between genetic material and electromagnetic effects. Yeah, I would say uh, uh, Dr. Montagnier is the most recent in a long line of investigators on what you would call, we might broadly call uh, wave biology or the effects of you know, low, uh, weak forces, low frequency electromagnetic uh, fields on biology. Um, and just to summarize, you know, what he has shown in the recent period is that the transfer of genetic material, the current idea of that, and this has been implicit in the discussion so far, is something that may have to be completely overturned. Mm -hmm. um, the very idea of genetic material may be, an, uh, a, you know, an old, may have to go out the window. Right. Um, and basically what he showed is that it appears as if it's possible for DNA uh, to replicate itself through the mediation of water and that part of what's involved in the mediation of this DNA is the frequency, the emission of low frequency radio waves or at least low frequency waves in the, in the radio spectrum Right. Um, using fairly uh, crude instruments uh, relative to the, to the type of uh, sensitivity of the biological material he's working with. So that one of the things that, that he's trying to do is improve the sensitivity of the, of the instrumentation. But a clear signal is emerging when you take biological material, when you take viruses, bacteria, um, and in some cases just DNA, pure DNA, dilute it in water mm -hmm. to the point that the actual original material is no longer present. Mm -hmm. Having that dilution stimulated by background radiation. Now what's interesting about the background radiation is it's in the same frequency range as what we call the normal natural background radiation. Right, you use like 7 hertz frequency it, radiation, right? Right. And when it's so stimulated, it has this water, which seemingly now no longer has any 
biological material mm -hmm. uh, in it is capable of emitting a higher frequency range of radiation right between one and three thousand hertz right not only that though he has shown that if you take another tube of diluted pure water which never had any biological material in it mm -hmm. you place it adjacent to the emitting sample uh, not only will it begin to take on begin to emit uh, a characteristic radiation hmm. but if you put in the so-called the you know raw ingredients of of DNA if you put in nucleotides primers and you uh, conduct what's what's known as uh, the PCR technique the polymerase chain reaction which is what's used to to uh, uh, basically copy DNA um, then you will get a recreation of the full original strand of DNA that was placed in there. Hmm. Now, it appears as if that the only way in which that could happen is if the water somehow contained uh, a pattern or contained some kind of structure that it was able to impart to this biological, these biological raw materials. Right, like if you just poured cement into a thing of water and somehow what emerged was the Lincoln Memorial or something. You wouldn't say that was just a purely random coincidence. There must have been something organizing that. You'd have to investigate it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and which is exactly what uh, Montagnier is trying to do and get others to, to verify this because if it's, if it's verified, if this effect is verified, it could very well, it very well would be one of the most significant discoveries of the last hundred years mm -hmm. in biology because if you think about what it could mean in terms of the transmission of, you know, genetic information, for lack of a better word. Right. It means that you're dealing here at, at a microscopic level, at, at a molecular level, uh, with a process, one that's intimately tied to the global environment, to this background stimulating radiation, because it should be said that this effect is not observed when it's not, when you don't have that stimulating radiation. Right, if you just have the tubes beside each other, you go through the same process, you're not going to get any effect, but only whenever you have this right. background stimulation, this 7 hertz background stimulation. Right. Hmm. Um, it, it's showing this, this uh, intimate connection. Now, I said that, that, this, that uh, his work is, is the latest in a long line of researchers looking at this. There's a huge body of, of material that has shown uh, very provocative correlations correlations of uh, geomagnetic and solar activity with behavioral traits of organisms, even uh, psychological traits of human beings. Right. Um, you know, there's no shortage of correlations of, of clear connect of, of, of some kind of influence of low level, uh, low frequency radiations on organisms. Right. What's absolutely totally unclear at this point is what the so-called mechanism of that interaction is, which has been the basis of a lot of rejection, at least the official, uh, you know, line, on, the party line on this from, from, the, stat, from the mainstream mm -hmm. is that this can't happen because we can't think of any, any mechanism right. by which action in, at this molecular or cellular level could actually be affected by such low level, low frequency, really low intensity radiation. Right. The fact that no mechanism exists is actually a promising thing right. because it means it, it really implies that what you've got waiting for you on the other side of, of the breakthroughs still to come is a completely new understanding mm -hmm. of what these radiations even are. Right. Um, I should say that you can go across the whole spectrum. In this case, uh, very low frequency, what's known as, uh, you know, uh, extremely low frequency radiation, ELF, VLF, mm -hmm. very low frequency. Um, those kinds of effects, again, huge body of work. You can go all the way on the other side and look at the high energy, so-called ionizing radiation. You get a similar gap that shows up in our understanding. Mm -hmm. It's timely that just this last week there was the release of uh, new information by a researcher up at the University of Massachusetts showing that back in the 1940s, uh, the evidence showing beneficial effects of very low levels, low doses of ionizing radiation, which is the sort of, when people think of nuclear radiation, 
that's what's meant by ionizing radiation. It's at the higher frequency spectrum, things like gamma rays and so forth. Well, it always has a very destructive connotation associated it does, with yeah, it. It does, yeah, that it's stripping you know, molecules and, 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 uh, and so forth. But it's come out that the evidence showing that there was beneficial effects, beneficial biological effects mm-hmm. of low doses of this radiation, which obviously at very high doses is destructive. Right. Um, you know, and we're protected in large degree by our atmosphere from very high doses. Right. Uh, that this was covered up. And the, the consequence of that was, is, you know, 50 to 60 years of complete irrationality on the nature of radiation, the nature of you know, even d- down especially to the question of things like regulations on radiation safety and so forth. Uh, what the, the scientific, so-called scientific term that came out of this, or the, the, the rule that came out of this, was something called the linear no-threshold theory, which basically means that there's no difference, uh, qualitative difference in effect at the high end versus the low, the low end hmm. of radiation on biology. It's simply a matter of taking the worst effects and saying, well, it gets incrementally less worse as you get incrementally lower doses. Mm-hmm. When in fact, what you find is uh, the, uh, uh, the actual nature of the process uh, can be characterized by something called hormesis, radiation hormesis, which was termed by uh, a scientist named T.D. Lucky, an American scientist still alive right. today, hmm. which is you know, basically the idea that you have opposite effects of these radiations at opposite dose levels. Right. Now, the reason I bring that up is just that it implies if the, you have this kind of completely di- different qualitative, these different qualitative effects, then you have to re-examine the entire foundation of the assumptions of what the effect of radiation of any frequency is right. on biological material. And what it really calls into question, uh, more specifically in, when you get into the higher ranges, but, um, but also more broadly, is whether or not you can conceive of this as some sort of kinetic, uh, basically destructive you know, kinetic process where high energy photons or particles are knocking out genetic material mm-hmm. and causing the mutations that are supposed to be at the basis of evolution and everything else right. in, in biology. It gets at looking at, you have to start to look at what are the harmonics among these different types of radiations. I mean, because we'd obviously think it was absurd if someone said, well, because eating a steel beam might kill you, therefore any amount of iron in your diet is bad. Mm-hmm. We obviously know you need a little bit, but it's all about what's the proportion that's involved, what are the harmonics of the, the ratios that are involved in this. Right. And it seems like this has a similar kind of quality to it. And I think it is useful to, to consider it in the context also of you know, evolutionary history to be able to, to look at the sorts of changes that you would have in the environment, so-called, um, right. or what might now be referred to as climatic changes. And we know that those are dramatic at every point of you know, punctuated change in evolutionary history, whether at points of mass extinctions mm-hmm. or major evolutionary shifts. Um, it's imperative to now incorporate these types of phenomena, the background level of, ra- uh, of ionizing radiation, the type of very low frequency radiations that are an effect of all of the environmental parameters, atmospheric parameters, that we know life has a, uh, a, a seminal role in directing and creating over geological time. Right. Um, so this opens our minds up, I think, to rethinking both at the sort of what you began with, Cody, which is both at the level of the very small, the microphysical, right, uh, looking at cellular and molecular processes, but having to understand that those can't be understood outside of the context of what we might call, I think maybe now coin a term, of cosmo-biogeochemistry. Right. Because you brought up in just what you went through two sort of extremes of the electromagnetic spectrum as have been mediated and sort of controlled by life the extremely low frequency, things like the 7 hertz background radiation that you mentioned with uh, Montagnier's work, which we've also measured as what we call the Schumann resonances, Mm -hmm. something which is the standing wave frequencies around the entire planet, which are themselves charged by lightning, which as you've discussed in uh, a video you did before, we can think of as being lightning being an effect of 
the movement of life onto land, the development of weather systems on land, the formation of storm clouds and you know, the resulting lightning, then charging these Schumann resonances, which seem to play a very vital role on a global basis of facilitating living processes. Then on the other end of the spectrum, what you brought up, the development of life of things like an atmosphere, which regulates the types and frequencies of high energy radiation that make it into our environment. Right. So you see this constant history of life mediating its relationship to the electromagnetic spectrum to beneficial effects. And I think referring back to the image that, that uh, you, know, you painted, Sky, of these successive nested cycles of biological time, I mean, you can see the effect of living processes on shaping the totality of the environment. And now we have to think of environment as including all of these phenomena. Uh, that appears to also accelerate over geological time. You know, it took a billion years to create an oxygen atmosphere, you know, give or take. Um, but then you see, you know, tens of million year, uh, of years to, to move on to land, create the sort of density of, of hydrological movement that could create thunderclouds and so forth. And uh, I think as you see this accelerating, the power of life to shape its environment, we have to think about, well, what, how, where then do you place human beings in that process? Right, right, which is what we began with introducing in the beginning, which is these are exactly the, the scale of effects that we're going to be intervening into with things like the development of the Bering Strait project, the Nawapa project, um, things of this scale where there is a potential to change the entire geology of the planet. It's our foot in the door to really begin to, to take that, you know, our evolutionary imperative seriously. Right. And maybe, you know, in history will be thought of as a dry run for our terraforming other planets. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. So I think maybe that's where we can leave the discussion today, is that it, it opens up really more questions than answers of whenever we take in the entire scope of cosmic radiation, the electromagnetic spectrum, into our investigation of life and processes of life on the planet and evolution of life on the planet, we now must think, how are we intervening into and changing that dynamic through projects like NAWAPA? And as O Young said, it's through what we learn in looking at that process of development, which is going to give us the insights into what we must think about in terms of moving out into the cosmos and colonizing other planets. Where we have to think about recreating the entire spectrum of effects and dynamics to be able to support human life elsewhere. So I think that might be the topic for our next roundtable discussion. So people can look forward to that. And I thank everybody for watching.